everybody. Um, so our talk today is going to be on securing your container supply chain. So I wanted to talk, uh, first we're gonna introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Katie, um, and this is my wonderful teammate, Diego. Hey folks. <laughs> We work for Microsoft. We are what's called uh, App Innovation Global Black Belts. Does everybody know what that means? No, huh? You laid it down. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Oh, hey, there's a former DBV, right? So basically what we do is uh, we work with customers out in the field to kind of um, innovate uh, the products that Microsoft sells. So we have a lot of deep technical knowledge and we work with like a lot of big customers on um, everything for app modernization. So we do serverless, we do Kubernetes, we even have gotten into uh, the low code space. So um, it's been, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We see a lot of different customer scenarios. Um, on a personal note, um, Diego and I enjoy cooking, eating, I CrossFit very, very poorly. And uh, Diego, what, what can you say about yourself? I like to ride tractors in Prince Edward Island around <laughs> corn mazes, <laughs> of all things. So, uh, and then uh, we have a colleague who is kind of like our honorary co-presenter, Ray. And Ray, Ray is here represented as the coyote. We'll see the coyote <laughs> across different slides from this point mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah. So, um, so one of the things that we see in Kubernetes, right, this is like a really advanced path that uh, kind of we don't see a lot. A lot of times we just see the dev build and push their image right to Kubernetes, right? And everything always works like so well and everything is perfect and very easy. Um, and uh, Diego and I were like, huh, you know, turns out that's just not always how it works, right? No, and I think one of the things that, I mean, again, working with customers that we see is there's a, you know, there's this period of time where everything is like unicorns and rainbows and things that just work out and it's lovely on my machine. I think I actually saw a sticker, it works on my machine. I think I picked those up still. Um, and then, the, you know, when, when Katie was telling me about, hey, there is something here that we should take a look at, it's not that simple. Um, how do you actually ensure that the container image you have on your laptop or you know your CI um, it's actually the one that's running that somebody didn't tamper so we think about NPM and all of the madness that can go around that and you know not to pick on, on JavaScript or any of that but that's one of the things we've seen um, there was another use case you mentioned too with solar winds yeah the and solar winds hack that's kind of what you know thinking about malware that's being inserted now you know this might not have solved that problem but it's just, if you think about it, it's just a kind of another layer in your onion that um, you can help provide some type of support even if it's not gonna catch everything, you know. It, it's a start and we wanted to look at, these aren't the only tools of, that are available to help do this. These are just kind of what's currently out there and something that we found interesting and we can, um, we adapted to some customer, customer scenarios that we had. So um, it was it was like a really fun kind of thing to investigate and see what's out there and help other people kind of think about how to secure their uh, container supply chain and uh, what they can do and just what the different tools that are out there right now and what might be coming. Yeah, so maybe we wanna go real quick on like an overview on this here before yeah. we kind of dive into the concept. Go ahead. Um, and maybe just a couple of caveats to this. I mean, we're probably all familiar with how CNCF projects come and evolve, right? Whatever we're talking about is probably applicable today. Six months from now, chances are you're gonna have to, because we have a repo, you're gonna probably have to update, we're gonna try to update as well, but versions go up and go and all that. So look at this into like a snapshot in time of what can be done today. Uh, if you look at that picture there, so we have a developer, uh, again, at your point, like coding, pushing stuff from the local laptop, um, you know, running Docker. And then what we wanted to do is we wanna be able to sign that image that I'm creating locally here. So you can see that I have notation there from uh, the Notary uh, project. So we're signing that, we're keeping certs in Key Vault, in Azure Key Vault. So we're making sure that we can reference this back later on. And then you can see that we have a signature. That signature gets pushed from our laptop into a secure location. Um, the moment we have Azure Container Registry running for us, we can now verify in two ways. 
from a developer perspective, we're going to show you and, and Katie will go through all of the concepts about, hey, is that actually valid in there? If I actually manually, when I run a command and say, that is, that's actually valid, we can do that. It's going to be in ACR. And then later on, we have components in Kubernetes. So we're looking at Gatekeeper and Ratify at the bottom there, if you, if you keep going down, that will also check. What are we checking for? We're checking for pods. Pods that we're running based on images. These images will have a SHA-256 signature attached to them. So if that is a mismatch, we just don't want it to run. We're going to intercept that call. We're not going to allow it to run. Um, so two ways here. If it's signed, approved, you can run. If it's not signed, just deny at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is kind of made the magic is like the admission controllers are really what's, you know, uh, allowing this to happen. So uh, we're going to take you through some concepts. Here's our, you know, coyotes. You can enjoy this for a moment while we, we think about what concepts we're going to go through. So the first one is um, OCI and ORIS artifacts. Um, just like if you're not, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's like kind of familiar with it, but we just wanted to um, throw it out there. It's just uh, an open con container initiative, um, just set standards for container images. And one of the big things it looks at for uh, in this is the config.media type. And then everything has to be dependent on like an OCI compliant um, container registry. So everything that runs through that has to be compliant. And you have, then the second part of this is you have ORIS, which is just like your registry, which kind of just extends um, what can be, uh, what kind of artifacts can be saved that kind of relate to your container. It's not just like a container image. Um, it's like non-container artifacts also can be uh, stored in ORIS, and you kind of use it to you know, discover artifacts, use the OCI registry as storage, and um, that's, that's basically, uh, I just wanted to bring up those concepts in case you're not familiar with them, just to see what's going on. So one of the big things that um, the signing that we do is with, we use something that's called Notary. Um, it's, it kind of solves the, problem of trusting content uh, within and like across all the different registries. So it just makes sure that whatever we put in the registry is what we expect and nobody has tampered with it. Um, it keeps a record of all the changes that happen inside the containers so that we know uh, if something has happened to it. Um, so it's kind of like a super detective that like, you know, sniffs out if anything happens. So uh, this is just kind of some, these are just like the high level um, concepts of what it does, right? So the artifacts are signed with private keys, but then they're validated with public keys. And a little bit more about it, um, like why should, you know, what else does it do? So you have to, you know, you're thinking about concepts like content trust, ensures integrity and provenance of your uh, container images. Um, and it does that, you know, because they sign them with, with keys. Uh, you have transparency. Uh, it maintains that log, um, so it's easier to track, you know, what changes has ha have happened. Uh, scalability, one thing that's nice about this, it's set up to handle um, large scale. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that I want to mention on specifically on order here, yeah. um, the moment we have these components running in the cluster there, it's kind of like a fire and forget situation. Um, if you don't have this, you would sign in one time and then the next time, let's suppose we're deploying um, Nginx here, but somebody tampered with that installation or something got wrong you know, throughout the CI CD pipeline. Uh, Notary would actually deny, even though you might have gates throughout the pipeline that needs to be approved and everything is okay, everything looks okay from an EMO perspective, uh, Notary could stop that, but it is transparent on that respect because you do have the cryptographic key it will say, hey, there's something here that doesn't match, um, and it will alert the user, like, just, I'm not gonna run this for you, right? And this is kind of, as it stands today, there's a lot of small components that if they're not all lined up together, this won't work. So the difficulty here is that. Uh, the beauty when this all works is, you know, what we have here, like the transparency end-to-end -end from a user, because um, I guarantee you, and, and maybe I should put that as a question here, if we were to start enforcing too much things on developers, they will bypass that. They're like, I'm just not doing this. So that's, I think that's the beauty of having something like Notary um, as part of the solution. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, it manages you know your offline operations. Um, it allows so it uses um, you know you can sign it without necessarily relying on uh, an external service and has fl flexibility. It supports like a variety of different uh, container registry types. Okay, the next the next piece of this is um, OPA Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper. So uh, this has two big components to it. One are the constraints, and that's just kind of your representation of your security policy and the constraint templates. And those are statements that kind of, um, that's just like the declarative form, kind of like, you know, a YAML file uh, saying, you know, what what is your security policy? So you might have um, an ex like a constraint that declares uh, allowable set comp profiles to be deployed to like a specific namespace. Yeah. But then, so that's your constraint, but then your constraint template is what allows you to go and extract those values and apply logic to that and see like, hey, can this really go to this namespace or not, so. Is anyone actually using Gatekeeper? Are you using prod or development, both? So you would see like, if you're already doing that, you already know how to do radical at that point, you already have, you know, the so statements like, yeah. maybe I'm trying to block, um, I don't know, a you know, PID to run a remote open SSH server or you name it, right? Um, so we, we, that component sits in here to ensure that policies are applied. So you kind of need all of these side by side for this, this thing to work. And uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate that we have a little, a little demo. We can also show kind of the repo there. Um, but then what we have is, you know, Gatekeeper with some pre-canned policies, so we didn't create anything new. We're relying on what um, all of the other components, when they come and they spin up, they already have some things in place. So at this point, we're not really writing any regular statement. You could, but we're kind of taking the vanilla approach of whatever it's outside of the box, we're gonna go with that. And, at that point, it's pretty secure. It's actually locked down in many ways. And it's and it's really nice too because you, obviously it's customizable to whatever you know security or whatever policies your organization feels are important and that you, um, you know, I know there are all these like regulations yeah. out there now and all the different industry specific solutions. So like, how do you, you know, this would be a great way to, well, this would be one way to think about. Um, applying those policies and kind of have them centralized, have reusable uh, code snippets and instead of like maybe having logic all over the place that does it. Let me go to the next slide. And this is just some more like, hey, what else can, what else can Gatekeeper do? Like what else are people using it for? So like auditing. Um, so it, it like, it will periodically like investigate um, your environment against and, and all the resources and validated against the constraints that you have declared to make sure that nothing you know has um, change I think drift as I showed that yeah point. yeah config drift yeah um, yeah like uh, you dry runs you have like um, so you can test canary re re um, releases in a cluster um, namespace exclusion narrow the scope um, of the of the resources that a policy can be applied to. So kind of there is a th another component here, so we kind of touched on two of them. There's a third component, which we're gonna go next, um, called Ratify. So Ratify um, is- It's the workflow engine. Yeah, it's an actual workflow engine. Um, I, and I think, you know, speaking for both of us, we spend a, more of our time, I mean, deploying Gatekeeper, to be honest, is almost a no-brainer. It's mm -hmm. a Helm chart, you fire, forget. There's a little bit of configuration, not many. Mm -hmm. um, Notary and notation. So on the client side, there are some configuration there. They gotta be a little careful. But Ratify is where I spend a lot of my time trying to understand what was going on, especially. So if you do, and I suppose that we're gonna try to do some of this, if you do deploy this and you say, Oh, I got that wrong, whatever it is, the moment you remove that helm chart, it will leave behind like a handful of CRDs. Just FYI. If you don't remove those, you're not gonna be able to just install with a different configuration because those CRDs point to some secrets, some config maps in different namespaces. So you would yank the whole Helm chart and you also probably write some XARGs to remove all of the, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's all the bash glue that we have to write. 
Yeah. Should remove all of the rest of the stuff that are in there, just, just so you know. So in case you're testing, getting frustrated, that's probably why. So if you have to be like, I gotta change this one little parameter, remove everything, put everything back. Yeah. And so those were kind of the big, the big pieces that yeah. we uh, worked with to get, to get this working. So um, I guess our next, we're gonna have, you know, show me the money. Right. Let's go and show a little bit of, um, of the demo there. Yeah, so let me go here. Um, I think we don't have anyone else over here. There you go. And maybe you just want to do a full scale? Let's do it. Yeah, bam. Okay, yeah, I'm going to hit play. Yeah. Can you, can you, can yeah. you see? You want to you move? So a couple of things in here. Um, I mean, this is just a schema for now. This is coming from TTY rec for some of us old FreeBSD users. That's where it's coming from. So what am I doing here? A uh, couple of things, we are, so this is the, in the local laptop as from a developer perspective, so Katie is developing this. Um, we're logging in into a container registry through notation. So think about the stuff you would do with Docker, the local binary on your laptop, we're now using notation for that, that's our binary. Mm -hmm. So we're logging in, getting those credentials, and at this point now, you're gonna see that um, in there, but I hopefully don't know. we'll get away. I couldn't get rid of it. But anyway, um, what do we have now? Now I'm gonna build an image. So I've logged in. So this is a caveat here. If I if you're familiar with AZ CLI in Azure, we're not gonna be doing a, a login back to HCR through AZ CLI or through Docker. You need to do this through notation, otherwise this won't work. And that's that's a little bit of the caveat there. But the moment you're logged in, you can now build um, that image. And that command right there, we're building directly against the container registry. I don't have that on my machine. It's pulling the source code from somewhere, and then the Docker file is also there, and it's building everything at that point in time in Azure directly, so not on my laptop. And you can see we're just, it's a regular Docker build at this point, uh, so it should, it should look familiar. Now the second thing that's happening after that is that we are gonna just sign that. So remember, we built this image. So think about your Nginx or whatever we're building here. Now we need to get that because we built this. So think, think about automating this through a CI-CD pipeline. You have that built and you're now pointing that SHA-256 signature back there. So it, it's actually going to be attached. So this is where um, when Katie was talking about Aura's, so we're not just putting an image per se of a uh, container, we're now storing all other artifacts. And that's one of them. We need that for later on. So for now, we build something, we logged in, we build, we put a signature up there. Uh, from this point here, um, there are a few directions we can do. Uh, what I'm showing you is just, can I verify the images I have? So you're gonna see I'm typing notation ls, and then I'm pointing this again to ACR. So the tool is local, kind of like Docker, but I'm pointing this there. The more you do this, the more that tree will grow now with different signatures. You can also remove and you can prune and clean those, right? So the importance here is that um, it is there, I can see it as a user. Now, let's suppose a different user comes in. Can that person verify that? You can, as long as you have access to the actual keys that were used here. Remember, this is like a, it, we're using certificates for this that are stored in key vault. So the moment the user, uh, the developer has access to that, um, you know, he or she can try this out. And um, this is what we're showing at this point. We're verifying whether or not that was uh, signed. So the command is notation verify, you point this back up and you can see it says successfully verified. If you try this with an image that was tampered, it will just say, no, I cannot verify that. That's one scenario. Scenario two, which is you should also be aware, which is a caveat right now, is that if you keep rebuilding this, again, as you're like tinkering and you're trying different things, it will fail because it takes 24 hours for, <laughs> yeah, um, for this to be refreshed in the cluster. Now, there are ways to get around this, but by default, that's kind of what it is. Um, so just be aware. I mean, I have some notes in our repo about all of the little things that we were bumping against, and that's one of them, unfortunately, at this point in time. So right now, 
Um, everything is looking good at that perspective. It is signed, we know what it is. Um, and then if I just do, you know, kubectl run dash dash image and I point to that either v1, so column v1, or to the entire like SHA-256 that will run against the cluster and it will work. The opposite of this is if I try anything else, it will just say, nope, cannot run at this point. Um, so what we have out of this would be, if I have already a private cluster, if I already have um, all private endpoints to that cluster, how do I make sure that my developer, when that person is you know, using this image or the CI CD, which is probably another developer, I mean, what we're showing here is a step, baby steps. When I automate this, I wanna make sure that the signatures match, right? And that's kind of uh, what that is there. Uh, I wouldn't, um, this can all be copied, I mean, it's us Linua, but um, we also have all of the commands and everything automated in the, uh, in the repo. I'll just quickly go back to this. So uh, if you want to see <clears throat> the resources that are associated with this, um, we have our own uh, GitHub repo. Um, we're, at, again, AppDev GDD. Um, it's called The Chain. Um, I'm a big Fleetwood Mac fan, so. <laughs> this became the, the chain joke. Um, it's all in there um, right, right now as it stands. So can you put some extra um, links in here? So just size for this, the first one, and we can probably open so folks can see. It is all done in Terraform. That's the, the first link that we have for our team. So it's a bit of bash script and the rest is just Terraform, just to spin everything up. You don't have to use Terraform for this. You can just you know do this through bash if you want to. Yeah. Uh, that's fine, I have an example on that too. Um, from a learning perspective, because what we have there is mostly, I just wanna you know kick the tires and see how this actually works. That's what we have. But from a learning perspective, that link there, uh, build and assign a container image from um, Microsoft Learn is where you can actually have a step-by-step. -step. It will go through all of the things that we're showing here locally on your machine. And then the second chunk of that actually points out to the uh, uh, Days Labs. I don't know if you folks are familiar with, with them, but it points to their GitHub and they on their GitHub will show how do we interface this with AKS and all the yeah. things that we talked about. So in order to write a buy, it's on that second chunk. So it's a two to, um, side like tutorial. One is all local, and then the second one is how do we actually take this to the cloud and, and scale this out. Mm -hmm. Open up. And maybe some questions. I mean, I know we probably kind of, uh, we still have time, we kind of went in a, a bit of a hurry, but is there any questions or thoughts about um, you know some of these approaches? Should I get the mic? And I'm gonna leave this, I mean, we're, we're doing the questions. We're gonna leave this as a little bit of a, this wouldn't be a Kubernetes talk if there was no memes. So hopefully that's not you by the end of your experimentation with this. Question about the signing phase. With what identity do you use to sign and where do you keep the private key? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, there are a few examples in, in the actual uh, repo. We are using workload ID for this. So the moment I create the AKS cluster and maybe I, I will go back here and open up um, yeah. the Terraform for us. So it, it's, it's using workload ID. Um, if you... It's in the diagram too yeah. that, that we have. But if you were to go back and look at the docs, um, they have a service principle being used. So when we decided to actually have our own repo and, oh, it's not showing there. We, we um, maybe you can put it in there. Yeah. So we've decided that workload ID is where we wanna go, right? So as the cluster gets bootstrapped, we also have a user manage, um, and then we use a workload ID with that. So I, I extract that object ID and client ID, and that's what I use. Now in terms of the certs themselves, uh, right now they're being, they're self um, certs. So we're generating through Terraform. You can generate this just through um, a JSON file and 
point this to Azure Key Vault, and Key mm -hmm. Vault will uh, get that for you. So you have the CRT and the PEM, you can download those. And this is what I'm doing at this point. And, and you know, we, we've used Azure just because we're Microsoft, but this is really a, you know, a cloud agnostic solution. Yeah, so if you were to, um, again, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll share all that in here with the talk and everything, but it's, it's all you know, a chunk of this here. Uh, we also have a jump box, so in case you don't wanna install any of these on your machine, I provide a jump box, you can SSH, it will firewall to your public IP, so just your way, like it will create a firewall rule and you can access that, and I have kubectl, helm, notation, all of that pre-installed as an image in there. Um, in case, you know, in case folks wanna, wanna go there. You just route. wanna check it out and kinda yeah. not. <laughs> Yeah, but that's a good question though. So um, again, two paths. The one that you will see out of the base documentation is using service principle initially. And then they have a second set where they mention a workload ID. Uh, so this is what we have automated. It's all using workload ID. Because I think that's more realistic for, mm -hmm. for anybody who runs it in production versus dealing uh, or babysitting service principle. I don't think anybody wants that. Mm -hmm. But uh, thank you for the question, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for uh, Thank for you coming. for your time, everybody. Yeah. Thanks thank for you. attending. And if you have any questions, you know, we'll um, ha be happy to help. Yeah, we'll be around here if there are yeah. any questions. Thank you. Thank you.